Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second day of Cliveden. Um, an appropriate place, I think you'll agree, for a discussion on the dangers of modern espionage. Um, the swimming pool is just, is just behind us, um, one of the great arenas of modern spy history. And so we have an amazing panel here today um, who, will be, um, who will be discussing the new age of, of espionage in, in the 21st century in the circumstances of an aggressive China, um, an imperial, um, extremely aggressive Russia, and Britain's place in it. Um, we really have an amazing panel for you today. Um, we have Misha Ziga, who, Michal Ziga, who is the- You prefer is, to call him Misha. I call him yeah. Misha, um, <laughs> who is the, you know, really the, the preeminent expert on what is happening in the Kremlin. Um, we have Sir Alex Younger, former head of MI6, um, we have Calder Walton, whose new book, Spies, is in front of Excellent, who treats, by the way, the Cold War and what is happening today in a single um, narrative and analysis, which is surely the way to see it. Um, we have Andrew Soldatov, who is the chief expert on the internal workings of the Russian security organs. And we have Dame Pauline Neville Jones, former head of the Joint Intelligence Committee. So we also may well be joined by um, a former director of the CIA um, who may be sitting at the back. So I think you'll agree we have a pretty impressive, <laughs> we have an impress pretty impressive um, committee here of people to discuss. What I'd like you to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to imagine that we are in the operations room um, uh, in, in the, in the, at a sitting of the executive committee of a small, uh, formerly great imperial power um, facing a new and deadly um, international uh, situation. Um, we can call that power Cliveden, if you like. Um, and we are going to try, and, in, a, in a very clipped way, since there are, there is quite a large um, panel, try and work our way through um, what is happening in the world today, how to deal with it in terms of espionage, and what happens next. I'd like to start, go straight in with Misha. Um, let's start with a report from the Kremlin itself. Um, you know, we know what's happened with Russia as sort of sliding into a sort of time of troubles, almost tri time of trouble situation um, after the Prigozhin mutiny. Um, what, is, what is happening in the Kremlin? Who is Putin seeing? Um, who's up? Who's down? Uh, and what next? You know, thank you for, uh, for your question. And let me start with, with a bit distant story. Uh, I've, I've discovered it recently when I was writing my, my, my book, War and Punishment, and uh, it deals with, with Putin's childhood. When he was a child, he was obsessed with uh, spy novels. Uh, his, his favorite uh, writer was a man named Yulian Simeonov. You might not know that name, but he was a mixture of John Le Carre, John Grisham, like the most f famous detective stories writer, uh, novelist in Russia. And he wrote a series of novels about a Russian spy who was uh, working in, in the Third Reich. Uh, he was, his real name was Maxim Isayev, but Stirlitz was, was his um, an undercover name. And, and, and he was the inspiration for Putin. He was the reason why Putin, why young Volva Putin decided to, uh, to apply for work in, in, uh, in KGB. And it's important because those novels uh, about Stirlitz uh, have become a huge, very important source of information for, for Vladimir Putin, and he uses that information till now. So I was, I was uh, trying to investigate uh, the reasons for his obsession with Ukraine, and especially with, with Bandera, with Ukrainian so-called Nazis, um, and like, when, when, when he was saying that he, uh, he needed to denazify Ukraine. And actually, the source of that knowledge was one of the novels uh, about, about Bandera, when uh, Stirlitz had to fight Ukrainian nationalists uh, and uh, Stepan Bandera as, as their leader. And actually, if you, and that, that, that novel is called The Third Card. Uh, and actually, if, if, you, if you read everything that's, that Simeonov puts there, that's exactly uh, the today Putin's language and the language of Russian propaganda. And they, they are using it, actually, that spy novel as a source of legitimate information. So, and I think that's very symbolic uh, to describe Putin's psychology. He doesn't need intelligence. 
he already knows. He, he has been in power for so many years, 22, yeah? He, he has grown to the position where he thinks that he knows it all. He, is the mo he considers himself to be the most um, experienced world leader. He, um, he started that war because he felt that uh, that was an his a historic moment for, for him when there, is, there was no one, very old man as American president, uh, a joke um, as uh, British prime minister, um, a very young guy he, he didn't respect uh, as French president, and no German uh, chancellor. So uh, he thought that it's enough uh, with all his knowledge, with all his strategic planning, and uh, we saw that, that, that obviously there was no real intelligence about the situation in, in Ukraine. He, he knew nothing because he relied on his corrupted um, uh, friend uh, Medvedchuk and, peop and people like him. He knew nothing uh, because he, he, w he cared about his inner knowledge because it, he thought that he knew everything about U Ukraine. He had a plan. That plan was, was too good to be true. And he didn't change it. Even now, if, even after the moment he uh, could not take Kiev within three days, even after Prigozhin's meeting, he still has the same plan A. He doesn't have plan B. Plan A is, is to take Kiev. And actually, he's waiting for um, Donald Trump to win. Um, and actually, but, he but, is waiting till yeah. November but of after, the next year. But after, but after where we are now, now where we are in, 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 in um, 2023, the Prigozhin mutiny has happened. Um, Defense Minister Shoigu is still in position. Garasimov is still in position as chief of staff. Um, it seems like the same tiny group around him. Just very quickly, who is he talking to now? Who is he spending his time with? As, as before, probably the, the, the second man is uh, Yuri Kovalchuk. Who, that, who most people have never heard of in England. Yeah, think, that's, or, that's or, or, probably yeah. the only Russian. We, we, we used to call all rich Russians oligarchs. So the only oligarch mm -hmm. who is a businessman and who, who can really influence uh, Putin is, is his old time friend Kovalchuk, and who shares all the conspiracy um, Put, Putin has. And actually, it's important because Kovalchuk's father was a historian, a uh, um, Soviet academician, and he was spe specialized on uh, Crimea and Sebastopol. So, uh, <laughs> should, too, should I say much, more? Too much history is a very dangerous thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so, Andre, just to move on to you, just to go in, since this is on espionage, um, just give us a, 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 a quick portrait of what is happening in the, F, in the FSB, in the GRU, um, what sort of operations they're planning, and what, where is their status in the Russian vertical at the moment? Well, probably the first thing we need to understand is uh, there is a huge difference in what, uh, say, Russian intelligence is supposed to do uh, and Western intelligence is doing. Uh, Western intelligence is mostly about collection intelligence, collection information. But for countries like Russia or China or Iran, the main task of intelligence agencies is to protect the political regime and to police uh, political emigres because they all have this sense of uh, fragility of a political regime back home. And it is extremely important for, uh, for Russian spies. They all share this feeling that we might have a very big country, but the political regime in the country has been always extremely fragile. It's, it goes back to two uh, historical traumas of the 20th century, 1917 revolution, when the Russian mighty empire collapsed, and the, the Tsar's secret service, the Akhrana did actually nothing to, to save it. And to 1991, when the Soviet Union, very powerful state, collapsed and the KGB again did absolutely nothing to save it. And that is why they think that a very tiny thing might start a new revolution, a new bloodshed, something which might completely destroy the state. And now they, they got a the proof. They got this Prigozhin mutiny. And now they think, look, we don't know how it might start, but we need to be, to, we need to be proactive. Even before the war, they were extremely aggressive, and they acted as they were war in the state of war, and that is why we got all these assassinations, all these explosions, all these subversive activities in, in Europe. Unfortunately, now they're getting even more aggressive. And I would say this military thinking 
now is shared not only by military intelligence, but also by the SVR, the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, and by the FSB. So these people are now, after political emigres in Europe, in the United States, in the UK, and we already have unfortunate examples when Russian journalists and Russian activists being attacked by uh, mysterious people in Europe, in Berlin, in Prague, and in, in some other places. And it's getting more and more aggressive, and, and they're getting more and more adventurous. Great. Well, I'm, we're going to come back to that in a second. So, so now we know what, what's happening on the Russian side. Calder, would you, Calder, would you just set this in the, in the scene, just on a wider... Uh, we're, really, we're not really talking about history today, we're talking about now. But just set this in, in the perspective of the Cold War, and is this a, is this a new Cold War? Well, thanks for the question. So I think that we in the People's Republic of Cliveden um, here need to appreciate that um, <clears throat> in many ways, as far as the Kremlin is concerned, uh, the Cold War never finished, never ended. So from their perspective, from key power brokers in the Kremlin, um, the, Cold, the Cold War never finished and there was a continuity there. Um, we see this most clearly with the Russian services after 1991 where we in the West thought that the KGB had disbanded and we could um, clap our hands, hands and say that was that, the end of history. But, but in fact, uh, the KGB uh, was quickly resurrected uh, after 1991. Um, they changed uh, the name into Russian Foreign Intelligence, SVR, um, into the Domestic Security Service, the FSB, um, but apart from a change of names, the GRU didn't even change its name, um, there was a continuity there. And of course, this continuity is uh, personified um, by Putin himself, a former KGB officer who makes so much about his both uh, real and imagined um, intelligence past. So there's a direct continuity there, I think, in terms of the, the leadership and the people that Putin surrounds himself with in the Kremlin, um, the men of force, many of whom with, with Soviet intelligence and Russian intelligence backgrounds and military back backgrounds. So um, to answer your question, there is a continuity there from Russia's perspective. Um, into this sort of depressing scene, uh, China has also and relatively recently entered. Um, it seems to me that we need to understand that it was during the so-called War on Terror when Western governments uh, resources, national security resources, were wholly focused on counterterrorism or predominantly focused on counterterrorism. Both Russia and China saw that as a golden opportunity to exert their grand strategies regarding the West. But I should also um, uh, warn, warn us here in the, the People's Republic of Cliveden that even though we call it a, a, um, uh, a new Cold War, or there's a continuity there, I think it would be dangerous to necessarily look to the past for all the answers about this new conflict. The new Cold War is going to be characterized, dominated by the new technologies that are coming online, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, um, machine learning, and then the, another lo looming uh, challenge of bioengineering. So that we need to have um, our, our eyes cast forward as much as I like as a historian to say uh, we want to look back. I think we also equally, even more importantly, want to be looking forward. Okay, so there's the situation where, where we, we find ourselves, Russia, Ukraine, um, China, behind, behind Russia. Um, so let's talk to our own intelligence paladins. Um, Pauline, what should we be doing right now? Right. Okay. And are we doing it? And then I'm going to ask you to develop that a little bit, if I may. Well, against the background of, of what we've just heard, including the likelihood of you know, a more aggressive stance from, from Moscow, the Joint Intelligence Committee will be assessing the situation and they will be looking at two aspects. What are the possible consequences, therefore, in, for Ukraine and the, and the warfare in Ukraine? Uh, and secondly, what about safety and security in the United Kingdom? Uh, because one of the things you clearly have to look after is you've got a lot, quite a lot of refugees in this country from, from, from Russia. 
uh, and a lot of Ukrainians. Uh, you have a number of vulnerable people, and their safety is something that you know, we can't ignore. So one of the one of the key things would be how resilient are we against the kind of attacks that come our way? And they will look at both the general case and they look at individual cases. I mean, they will take that very seriously. You can't start having assassinations on our streets. Second, second area, obviously, is what are the you know, what, what kind of scenario does uh, an increasingly aggressive Russia throw up for, for, the, uh, for the conflict in, in Ukraine? And there, obviously, the Ministry of Defense's advice and the, coming, the uh, information coming in from defense intelligence, who's not on our panel here, uh, that will be very important. And they will look at uh, an analysis of the current battlefield situation uh, and also, therefore, uh, you know, what options are thrown up for the Russians and what we need to look for and what kind of uh, defences and tactical and strategic advice needs to, you know, needs to occur. And as you will be aware, there is embedding of uh, Western, Western military uh, advice in, uh, in Ukraine. And all of this will you know, be used as a means of trying to counter uh, what... Um, Putin will you know, resort to. Uh, this is good. They will see it, I think, as quite, a, quite an important moment. It's very, very important at this stage that things do not get out of control for the West. Right. On the whole, we've had this, we've had this conflict broadly uh, under control, uh, not, uh, not making ground perhaps as fast as we might have do, but certainly the... You know, the Russians have not really been able to score successes. Very important that they, this now does not turn around militarily. So, Max Younger, you've, you've been an officer in the field, you've, you've run the SIS. Um, are we doing enough? Um, uh, and, if, and what should we be doing that we're not doing? Well, look, I'm, I'm a bit uh, worried about the Cliveden Executive Committee, if I'm to be honest, because I agree with everything, and that's actually completely useless. You know, we need some diversity in, in the conversation. Um, I particularly like the, the, the stuff about Putin being obsessed with um, uh, being... He totally identifies as a spy and, indeed, is obsessed with our intelligence services. So I got into a bizarre sort of proxy conversation with him through a third party, another <coughs> a sort of non-aligned intelligence chief who's actually quite a good friend of mine. And, and it was bizarre, and I kind of got it all back, this complete obsession specifically with MI6 because of the perfidious role that we've played uh, in the past. And for anyone who doubts the value of the nuclear deterrent, on one occasion he said, God, those Brits piss me off, um, uh, but I can't do anything about it because of those pesky submarines. So just remember <laughs> that. <laughs> and um, uh, I, th I think it's also true not to confuse us. We are entirely different. Uh, we do we, we, our, our methods... It, it constrained by our democratic norms are similar, but we do it for completely different reasons. And um, uh, I explained this to David Cameron once. I said, uh, do you know intelligence chiefs in other countries are much more powerful than I am in this country? And he said, are you threatening a coup, Alex? <laughs> But if I, if I were offering a bit of advice uh, to the Prime Minister of Clifton, I, I would talk about three things, and, and none of them would be about Russia. So I don't think the vital ground of this is, is Russia at the moment, because Russia isn't going to change. It, there is no plan B for Vladimir Putin. He's completely committed, and for all of the reasons you described, Misha, I just don't think he's got the capacity to adjust his approach. So the three things I would want us to focus on are, firstly, our alliances. This is a battle between the centralized and the decentralized world, and I, pre I predicted, we predicted very accurately that Putin was going to do this. We did not predict the power of the Allied response. And this is the vital ground for us. Mm. And it gets very political next year. I think the war is not going to be resolved quickly. It's going to get very political in the West. There are more elections than you can throw a stick at. And that has got to be where the Prime Minister of Clisdon puts a great deal of his or her <coughs> effort. Secondly... Fundamentally, this is not about war, it is about peace. So why did Putin invade Ukraine? He invaded it because he thinks Russia is not Russia without Ukraine, okay? Ukraine, for Putin to succeed, has to be in his sphere of influence. So for Putin to fail, it has to be in our sphere of influence. And that is about winning the peace, not just winning the war. It's kind of the lesson you could take from Korea, which where we sort of kind of stopped halfway. And that is about uh, the quality of security guarantees that we are prepared to um, provide. It's about our willingness to really uh, ramp up and, and the military capabilities that P 
uh, that Ukraine can be endowed with. Um, and it's about uh, the EU stepping up and giving um, Ukraine a, a, a pathway to being a normalized Western country. Um, and then thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, Russia's the acute problem, China is the chronic issue. Now, I, I don't equate the two. We're not at war with China. We need to cooperate in some ways with China, but we need to understand we're in a competition and wake up to it. And this dynamic, the Russia-China dynamic, is, I think, a really key part of how this might end at some stage. Apart from, I think, um, a principal set of good intentions in the US is the reason why the US is so closely engaged. <laughs> And by the way, I, I completely agree, the vital ground of that context is in the emerging technology space. Um, did you want to say something? No. Yes, I did, oh. I did but I really want to say, just say two things. But one is uh, that one of the areas of controversy in, 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 in the Western, among the Western partners is, can you actually win the peace without winning the war? Uh, it's an absolutely key question, uh, because that's going to turn on do we start making concessions you know, on things like uh, Crimea? Uh, so there are big unresolved issues. Uh, and at the moment, the West is simply going from day to day to day. And with behind, behind our, our immediate activities are these very big geopolitical questions about how you manage, how you manage the relationship with Russia well, later on. Well, let me just, I'm coming to yeah. you in a second, Gordon. Yeah. Misha, just, just give us a quick picture. We're, again, back within the Kremlin, from the mind view of Putin, um, you know, how much how much latitude will he have to negotiate? Do you think in the end? Um, who is the we? Does, does That's a he very think? good question. Yeah. Who is the we? Yeah. Mm. You know, is, is the we the Ukrainians or is it other people? I'm afraid that that any negotiations uh, would lead to would give him uh, the time, like um, to regroup and to attack again. Because as, as I've said, he's got his, his plan A. Mm -hmm. Plan A is to conquer Ky uh, Kyiv. I do not agree entirely uh, that he, his, his war is uh, to conquer Ukraine because he actually, I don't think that he really needs Ukraine. He needs to stay in power in Russia. So Ukraine is, uh, um, in a way, the, there is a uh, Zelensky's uh, idea that Russian Empire is possible only if uh, if, if it has Ukraine. And yes, they the, they all um, Putin has read the the Grand Ch Chessboard and, and knows that. But ac actually, he needs U Ukraine to create that uh, um, that situation in Russia uh, with hu with huge patriotic his hysteria with actually uh, fascist. Um, Movements and that's the only uh, the only atmosphere when he he knows he can control the society he can uh, keep out uh, all all the liberals and he he needs that he needs war mm. uh, he needs uh, war to continue to be in power in Russia so he doesn't need any negotiations he he doesn't need the peace I I think that the war is going to continue till the moment he's dead okay there, there is no way out okay well. <laughs> Calder, you just wanted to say something quickly. Yeah, two points I think that the Prime Minister of Cliveden needs to be thinking about, and that um, is the likelihood prospect in terms of winning the peace of Putin mm. using a tactical nuclear weapon um, in order to snatch some sort of victory from the claws of defeat as he sees it. It seems to me um, significant that he's talking about the war as an existential crisis uh, for Russia and under Russian military doctrine, the, the word existential crisis is the trigger for the use of nuclear weapons. So that's not insignificant that he's using that. And then I think we also need to be alert into, into that already incredibly worrying um, environment. Um, the role, I've, I've just arrived from uh, the US, um, of the Republicans cutting off aid to Ukrainians. And indeed, one step further than that, um, the the real prospect, as I see it, of a Donald Trump uh, presidency again in 2024 and what that will do for winning the peace um, mm. and, uh, and, and the West's Well, that's an alarming prospect, but let's just go back into intelligence <laughs> again. Um, you, you talked about, um, you talked about um, SIGINT and, you know, the sort of new sophisticated um, intelli you know, uh, technical intelligence, but let's just talk about human for a while and the, you know, the old-fashioned spying. Um, Alex, is it still possible to be 
Is it still possible to be a spy in the traditional way? I mean, you have to, it's very hard to actually, um, with all the, the technical passports and so on, it's actually very hard to send out a spy with, a, with an old fashioned legend and all that, isn't it? How much, how, how important is human spying going to be in the future? Well, do you think um, human relationships are old fashioned? No. <laughs> well, I think they still answer. matter. <laughs> they still matter. So, I, 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 think, I mean, obviously, it's a self serving, um, but I would be uh, surprised and not really want to occupy a world where the status of human relationships have been relegated. Um, uh, uh, ceded to you know a set of autonomous systems, which, by the way, having listened to Elon Musk the other day, is a possibility. But let's, that's probably a different conversation. So um, uh, 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 clearly, you know, I, I was an MI6 officer. I believe in this. Uh, interestingly, I was a big fan of Tolstoy when I was young. Big determinist sort of sweep of history. Nothing. It's not about kings and queens. It's about sort of socio-economic movements and all that. But when you become a spy, you develop a very healthy respect for human agency and the capacity of individuals to change stuff. So if you, you take an example, you know about Oleg Gordievsky, for instance, and look at the way in which he changed the world. Now, I'm not commenting on whether he was a spy or not, of course, <laughs> but it is remarkable the agency that, that he brought to this. Um, this but my key point here um, is that it's none of these capabilities stand on their own. So when I joined in 91, it was, it, it was we could be pretty solipsistic, you know, things weren't really joined up, the world wasn't really joined up, what happened in one bit of the world stayed in one bit of the world. Um, and that was shattered by digitalization. Uh, and then equally, teamwork wasn't that important, really, you could just get on with it. Um, that was sort of shattered by globalization and the hyperconnectivity it brought. Now, um, Interestingly, I, I felt in the, in, in the sort of 2010s, sort of round the Georgia invasion, the Russians were running rings around us to, uh, with hindsight, honestly. And, um, and I couldn't work it out. I couldn't work out why. And then the Russians told us why they were running rings around us in the shape of a thing called the Gerasimov Doctrine, right? So this is current head of the Russian armed forces who wrote a treatise about, uh, about hybrid warfare and the gray space and the fact that everything is connected to everyone, everything else. And you will prevail if you can concert all your capabilities across the spectrum, across peace and war, domestic, international, cyber and real, to a single objective. And I suddenly realized that they were doing that to us. And at that point, that's, you know, having been a classic MI6 officer, believing that we could do it all on our own and it was fine, I understood that our USP, our key advantage, had to be teamwork, and, at that, and we were being bested by the Russians. So, so the whole way in which we sought to develop was to integrate all of our capabilities to effect, not just in the covert world, but across government. And I have to say, David Cameron was very good with his National Security Council, which was kind of our way of trying to do the same thing. So I'm proud of the fact that by the time we finished, you know, the definition of cyber was very clearly the nexus of man and machine. And I'm proud of the fact that we, in the intelligence community, you know, we're, we're all quite driven people. We were sufficiently self-aware to subordinate our collective ego and actually work, particularly in the UK, where we're just the right size to do this, to properly integrate our capabilities. Because we work in the physical world and we do physical things in the physical world, but we need to have a digital situational awareness <laughs> that is the same as our old situational awareness of, you know, Miram Shah or Moscow or whatever it might be. And for our techni technology counterparts, remember the weakness and strengths of technology systems are, ultimate, are all ultimately human. <laughs> so you've got an integration here. And if, and if, um, if digital intelligence and private technology companies, uh, which, who are now prodigiously powerful, do a huge amount of the work and, f and reveal things, that's, that's good for us and bad for dictators. You know, I'm a complete fan. I don't feel threatened by this stuff because there will be an irreducible bit at the end, <laughs> which will, will only be revealed if you can stand next to the person in question. Yeah, Paul, a quick comment, yeah. and then I'm going to go. Well, I was just going to say, Andre, I mean, one of the things that, that the Western democracies did after the uh, supposed end of the Cold War uh, was, of course, to slash the budgets of our intelligence agencies. And so we reduced our capability very considerably. Uh, and the, for instance, uh, what happened in Georgia you know, took place at a point when our capabilities were relatively slender. I could not get either William Hague or David Cameron to take seriously what was happening in Georgia. They did not get it. Mm. Uh, and you can see why. 
Um, but of course, it was it was wrong. I mean, you know, we've changed our thinking and and uh, restored to a great extent. You know, the, the previous capabilities which we had uh, axed. It takes time. But I would think what I would also say, in addition to what Alex has just said, is that there are additional capabilities now, and there are new sources. And I do think one of the big changes actually is the use of open source uh, intelligence. Things that you can that people who are not part of intelligence services, but who have great, great capabilities, people may have heard of Bellingcat uh, and other organizations, which bring additional, additional capabilities. Uh, we also use satellites these days, so imagery is very important. So you, ed you end up with a more detailed and more immediate battlefield picture, but also potential for long-range analysis as a result of bringing both government capability and private sector capability who have to cooperate. And, and in many ways now the, re, the academic world is very important as an adjunct in, in research or for greater capability uh, and for, for new methods and for the new technologies and the extent to which, you know, when we move into quantum, how we do that safely. Before so there's, get, yeah. there's a huge, what I'm saying is that the, the uh, background against which our intelligence capability to take place now is technically much more ambitious uh, and much more capable than it was, say, 20 years ago. Thank God. What, mm. what did you want to say, Misha? <laughs> I, I, need, I, I need to, to move somewhere to, uh, to tell you the story about, about human relationships. Uh, like we, we need a story about assassination, right? Uh, it, it, happened, it happened about 15 years ago. I, I was, I was uh, covering that story as, as a journalist when uh, Russian, two Russian intelligence officers from, from GRU uh, had to organize the assassination of the um, um, leader of, 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 of Chechen rebels uh, who lived in exile in Doha, Qatar, Zelm Khan Yandrbi, he, he, he was self-proclaimed president of independent Chechnya. Mm. And I so met him once in Chechnya. While he was yeah. alive, probably. Yeah. Yeah. When he was alive. Uh, <laughs> but, but <laughs> keep going. Yeah, but in Doha, so uh, two two Russian officers came to Doha, and they they had to uh, to hire someone to get him killed. But they decided uh, to keep the money and to organize it themselves. So they they took the car at um, Evis or Sixth um, at the <laughs> airport, um, tracked his um, whereabouts. They learned that every Friday he goes to the mosque. So they came to the mosque while he was praying, uh, put the uh, explosive under the car, uh, explosion, he's dead. What's happening next? They are going to Carrefour, <laughs> buying um, a lot of whiskey, <laughs> taking Bulgarian prostitute, mm. and going to the, the, the villa of, uh, of um, Russian embassy in Doha, and keep drinking there for two weeks. And uh, that time, Doha is the central of um, um, the headquarters of uh, uh, American Central Command because the, the war in Iraq was still go going. So, so Doha is cl is closely watched by everyone. So definitely, uh, Qatari police knows everything about them and have to wait for a week when they come out with their Bulgarian prostitute, because mm. they, they need more whiskey. They yeah. ran out of whiskey, they were <laughs> arrested. Uh, then there, there was a trial in Doha, and uh, in the end, like in a year, Putin had to, uh, um, no, uh, Putin di didn't come to Doha. Emir of Qatar came to Russia, and they, they signed um, uh, um, Treaty or something. A treaty uh, that, that that anyone sentenced in Qatar could be um, could, could be extradited uh, to serve his sentence in Russia. So and that's what happened to them. Uh, obviously, they are free with their uh, medals uh, yeah. because yeah, the, it was very successful operation, much more successful than than Skripal's uh, or or Navalny's yes. po poisoning. So yeah, actually, human resources are not that great, and I, I'll tell you why. And um, it's very important what, what Andre said, that uh, there is a huge difference between uh, ways and methods and also ideals of different uh, um, uh, intelligence services. Because unlike, for example, in Soviet Union, most of current Russians, uh, they are very cynical. 
they do not believe in anything. And probably it's, it's very hard to, um, very easy to, to, uh, to assassinate people wh when, you, when you know that it's all about the money. Yeah. It's not about the motherland, it's not about big ideas, you are not fighting for, for, for something sacred, you are working for the money and, and that's it. Okay. Just yeah. not to briefly endorse yeah. this, they are complete muppets, this is really important, <laughs> yeah. not, not to just build them up. And I want Andre to talk about this the, as well, um, why this is happening. One example was when they uh, sought to hack into the OPCW in The Hague after the Skripal attempted assassination. And they were they were nicked because they were sort of useless. And um, they claimed to be some sort of internet outfit. And then one of them in his pocket had a receipt for the taxi from GRU headquarters <laughs> to the uh, <laughs> And yet, and yet, you know, these muffins every now and then do actually kill someone. Well, that's the problem. You don't Which have to be problem. very clever to do that. No. Do you? But you do so, have to be quite so clever. So let's not bring to in Andre. Andre. I mean, why has, I mean, first of all, one always reads that you know, Russian intelligence personnel has been degraded by the fall of the Soviet Union and all this thing. Um, uh, you know, why, who are these people? Why are they so, so ineffective? Are, do, are they as useless as they seem? They're not that useless, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Maybe, well, we are Russians, we are always uh, yeah, pe 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 pessimists, so I need to bring this pessimism here. <laughs> unfortunately, even if they are not extremely competent, it doesn't right. make them absolutely ineffective. Yeah. For instance, I remember when uh, we researched for this book uh, about Russian political emigres, uh, and it was right after Skripal was poisoned. And it was presented here in the UK as a big failure yeah. uh, because we were identified, because Skripal survived. It was not like uh, how this crisis was seen in the country. It was not how this crisis was seen by Russian political emigres. I made a point to ask this question about Novichok. Every prominent Russian political emigre here in the, United, in the United Kingdom and in the United States, every one of them took this as a message that they need to be much more cautious, that the Kremlin changed the rules, and actually it had a huge effect and impact on Russian political emigration and also on the people in the country. I had priests coming to me asking me for advice because they thought I had some sources in the FSB and they thought that now even the priests should be cautious about what they are talking about in Moscow. Mm. So it has a huge effect on Russian society even if these people look very incompetent. And also they are not that incompetent. No. Uh, even now as we speak they, can, they are capable of pulling off very very uh, daring operations. Look, just seven, uh, several the months ago. illegals. Bulgarian illegals. Uh, quite recently in Italy, mm -hmm. there was a guy who was arrested by Italian police and he was waiting for, extradi uh, for extradition to the United States. Uh, and uh, he, well, he escaped. Mm -hmm. He was helped by the Russian intelligence and now he's safely back in Russia. So they are still capable of doing things. Uh, yes. The level of, uh, of competence is, is not what we expected back in the Soviet Union, but to be honest, even in the Soviet Union, it was not that high. No. The, the other things which you need to understand is right now, because of some reforms in the Russian military intelligence specifically, we got more people in this in, uh, intelligence agency, which are, which are not about intelligence gathering, they're about uh, conducting special operations. But m because many of these people, they have special operations uh, background. So they, are, they don't care about cost. They don't care of if uh, some of the comrades get arrested. They need to do things, mm -hmm. and they get things done. Yeah, just explain, just explain quickly. We've got, a few, we've got a few more minutes, then we're going to open it up for questions. So prepare your questions. Let's just talk about these illegals that have been found. You, you know also have some, Calder knows a lot about this as well. But Andre, just explain just very quickly um, the principle of, of illegals. How many, leg, how many teams of illegals, I mean obviously this is, no one knows the answer to this question, but how many teams of illegals could there be out there in countries like Britain? Um, and why do, why do they so often come via South America? Um, as well, which is, you know, their ID, why do their legends and IDs come from South America so often? Um, and what is, and I'd just like to hear from all of you, what is the best way to, 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 to combat this? Uh, very quickly, quickly. as Alex said, uh, Russian intelligence has been obsessed with British uh, uh, intelligence services, mm -hmm. and they still think no. that Kim Philby is a big hero. 
uh, and they think that Kim Philbe was the most successful Russian spy, which is a nonsense because, first of all, he was not Russian. Mm. So you cannot train the next generation of Russian spies being inspired by an example of Kim Philbe. So what they're trying to do, they're trying to substitute for English communists of the 1930s with someone who they train now uh, pretend, and to pretend that they are from some other countries. Of course, they understand they cannot train British people in, mm. in, in, the, in, in Russia. So what they do, uh, they train these people to look and behave like foreigners, but they give them uh, passports of some faraway countries because they understand that these people actually cannot act and cannot behave as locals in the country where they should uh, operate. And also how you can use them. Mostly you can use them only to ask cutouts. They can help you to connect a uh, real spy with the Russian embassy, but mm. you cannot use them in real operation. You cannot use them to approach people because they have no connections, they are not actually locals, uh, mm. they are not Kim Philby, no. right? But they are desperate to try to repeat this success, which is... Calder just was coming there. So I, I think um, there's an old, say, old saying in the intelligence world that it is a spy who catches another spy, not technical <laughs> intelligence collection. So in other words, recruiting an agent in a foreign service that can spill the beans, give you the secrets about their operations targeting you, including illegals. So if I would like to just uh, emphasize that I think the war in Ukraine, if SIS and CIA at the back, if there is a CIA <laughs> <laughs> director here, uh, are doing their jobs properly, uh, the war in Ukraine um, should hopefully be a recruitment um, opportunity for Western services like SIS and the CIA. Um, CIA came out with a remarkable video, very well made a couple months ago, um, about targeting Russians, um, saying, you know, if you are despondent with your life, if this is not what you signed up to do, um, if you do not believe in Putin, um, this is how you contact us, the CIA, via the dark web. So this is, to Alex's point, it, it, it's the same old principle, human nature is the same, but new technologies, you know, through encrypted um, channels on the dark web, that's espionage in, in the modern era. Um, so I think, hopefully, the answer to your question, how do we know about illegals, is by recruiting mm. uh, agents inside Russia's services. Alex, just a, just a flat question, then we're going to do this, do this quickly, but this is a slightly large question. I mean, why is it that, I mean, it has Russia played a huge influence in... Um, degrading espionage to, in, in the use of wet work and assassinations, which have now been copied by you know, other absolutist powers around the world. And obviously, America has done, has done this sort of thing in the past. France most definitely has. Britain traditionally never has. Will, you know, should we and will we be forced into more kinetic action than we've been used to? You, you've explained... You've explained how at the early sort of 2000s we were way behind this and almost naive about the way we treated um, Russian espionage. Are we going to be forced down a dark road here and should we be? If you could just answer that rather large yeah, question. So, well, I, I will make two points. So Russia has set you know, a baleful standard and all this. This derives, as I'm sure um, my friends here will attest to, from their history. You know, the Cheka behaved like this even before the Soviet yeah. Union. This was a... Um, uh, it, it, the, Russia has been traditionally been run in an authoritarian and brutalized way, and this stuff passes for normal. Now, um, I utterly reject, of course, any moral equivalence between their antics and those of Western services. But we operate on a spectrum, and I want to be really clear. You know, we'll be implacable in pursuit of people who threaten our citizens, but it will be done within the context of our democratic values and the law. So do the military get involved at the, at the top end of, of, our, of, 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 of our work? Obviously, we have a very close relationship with the military. We provide them with a lot of intelligence. Um, uh, equally, we, you know, we, we, in, other, in other respects, we're thoroughly civilian. It goes back to my point, Simon. We should be able to flex across the whole thing. So I don't think we should be too fixated. It's, it's a question of the principles and the law and the democratic control that is applied. You know, I'm a former army officer, so, and, and the distinction between peace and war has fundamentally been eroded. So, you know, we, we fixate on the difference, but, you know, we, we'll work with, we work with the military, we work with the police, we work with the foreign office. Okay, so just before we go on to questions, just a last, I just want to, I want to hear from Andre very quickly. What next, Andre? And Misha, we're going to finish with you. Um, how will this, will, how will this end? Andre, quickly. Uh, very quickly. I think, first of all, we are 
overestimated in a way uh, cyber component. Uh, we spent years and years, especially after 2016, thinking that the next big conflict would be all about cyber. We don't see that happening in Ukraine. We don't see that happening right now, and we don't see that as the Russians are using all their cyber capabilities. They still rely on very old traditional methods of human intelligence, of uh, special operations, uh, and sources, and assassinations. So I think that's exactly what we, we're going to have in the near future. Right. Okay. Um, uh, Misha, if, just if, sum it up. What you, next? Yeah, if, How's if, this if end? If you ask me about, about Putin, uh, yes. definitely we we need to wait or just actively wait till the moment when he dies because his death is, is the only way out of the war. Uh, he's not going to stop it. No. And he's not going to resign. Next year he's going to be re-elected and, and that, that, he's a young man, he's 72, yeah, 72, uh, 73, is go yeah, 72 next week. Um, and actually, even when he's gone, I, I believe that Russian bureaucracy, and uh, I call it collective Putin in, uh, in one of my previous books, All the Kremlin's Men, collective Putin is, is strong enough to maintain uh, some kind of inertia even after he's gone, but at the same time, all of them hate the situation. They hate the war. They, they really want to de-escalate, de -esc but I'm afraid that um, you, I know you love the comparisons uh, between uh, Stalin's inner circle and, and Putin's inner circle. I think that the situation of, of Malenkov and Beria and Khrushchev um, killing each other and, uh, and fighting uh, for the power and without any substantial change in relationships between the West and Russia, because actually no, no one needs uh, that, that kind of peace that was achievable 20 years ago, unfortunately. Okay. Right, let's have some questions. Let's start with this lady right here, please. Oh, thank you so much for all the interesting comments. Um, earlier, I was the director of a Russian company, a mid-sized non-oligarch company. But I remember the CEO in, in uh, 2004, I mean, nearly 20 years ago, um, saying how the propaganda of Putin was saying that the children of Beslan were actually murdered by the CIA. And one assumes some Russians believed that. But now, coming up to today, what can we do in practical terms, you know, across all the agencies, be they in France or the UK, about the, the kind of digital blitz we're going to see with the elections coming up? We know there's a report in the Foreign Office, buried in the Foreign Office, which states how Russia influenced the referendum. With the upcoming elections here in the UK and the US, they say, why can't we expose this and give that information out? It doesn't seem to me that it's, it's something that we, why, why okay, can't we expose? Okay, I've got it, okay, brilliant. Um, I think this is one for Andre and one for Alex. So, Alex, will you answer that? Well, look, um, I don't think we should, I think we should not panic about this. So let us be entirely clear, the things that divide our society were made by us. And we have it in our power to solve those things. And the biggest damage the Russians could do to us is to allow us to blame all our problems on a hostile state. Primarily, most of this is homemade, so let us uh, keep it in proportion. But equally, it is dangerous. I entirely acknowledge that. And you, could, you need to rely on people in my community, particularly, to work to reduce the harm that this is going to cause. Uh, I think the, uh, so far it has not been um, as particularly significant, but the advent particularly of generative AI could completely change the game. And I'm very focused on, on particular technology solutions which allow you to um, track the provenance of information, which it is really clear to me the platforms right now should be legally obliged to incorporate into these products. That's fascinating. Uh, would, um, yeah, what yeah. we can do, uh, very quickly. Not Give all me the, the, Russian po the Russian point of view. Yeah, uh, not all the Russians who, live, who still are in the country are supportive of the war. Uh, we know that for a fact that there's a huge demand for real information about what is going on in Ukraine, what is going on in the world. We know that because the audience of Russian media in exile is huge, uh, according to our estimates, and you can, uh, it's, it's independently verified, it's about 20 million people. So we have 20 million people on a daily basis looking for news and watching Russian uh, uh, and independent uh, TV channel uh, doors online on YouTube. So what we need to do, we need to help uh, Russian media and exile 
to, uh, to reach out to this audience in the country? And it's a, it's a technical question because uh, as we speak, YouTube is still available in the country. Tomorrow it might be blocked. So we need to be ready for this next step of the Russian online censorship and find a way, technical way, how to make it possible to still communicate with the people who are in the country. Great, next question. Um, this gentleman here, please. Then you, if you like. Um. Thank you. Um, I think maybe there was a perception right at the start of the Ukraine conflict that the sanctions would be really effective. But first of all, do you think uh, they're effective? And if they're not, what else can be done to weaken um, Putin? Um, that's one I, for you, Misha. I know that they are not. I just a couple of days ago, I talked to, to a friend of mine uh, who is a very successful film producer, and, and she's moving back and forth uh, between M Moscow and London, and she tells me that, that she has never seen such amount of money in Moscow. There is a huge investment boom because all of uh, Russians who could uh, keep their money uh, in Western banks have to invest them in Russia. So it's like Russian economy is booming because of the sanctions, because of uh, uh, they, they, they cannot buy more uh, villas in France or because they, they have to buy something <laughs> in Russia. Um, actually, the only thing that, that needs to be done is like sanctions. Um, if, if, the, if there are sanctions against Russian citizens, there, there should be sanction, uh, sanctions against Russian oil. Because, yeah, we know that European countries are buying Rus uh, Russian oil via third parties. Turkey, Algeria, Egypt, you name it. There, there should, should be real sa sanctions that, that would hurt uh, Putin and Russian economy, not um, against um, uh, Russian tourists who, who are banned from, from getting uh, Schengen visas. They are coming, like uh, um, all, all the spies and all the bureaucrats are coming anyway because they, they have Israeli citizenship or, or like fake passports. Uh, if, if there is a, a real talk about sanctions, there should be real sanctions, not, not um, something that, that is not working. Okay, next question. Um, so um, I, I work for NATO's venture capital fund and we invest in all of the technologies that you guys have mentioned. And uh, one thing that, one, one major challenge we face right now is how do we protect the innovations that we have in the West from our adversaries? Because we have a very, very open system, they have a very closed system. So how do we do that without being too restrictive, forcing everyone Alex, to get TVs and security clearance and so on? That's a great question, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm completely conflicted. We've been mind-blowingly naive. We've uh, voluntarily transferred huge swathes of strategically relevant capability to, to China and to Russia. And of course, we've had a whole load nicked as well through a criminally negligent approach to our security online. So we need to wake up and understand the salience of what you're saying. Equally, two things. Um, one, uh, our capacity freely to exchange ideas and knowledge is at the heart of our creative miracle in the West. We can't close that down. And two, and I think in my, to my mind most decisively, this is going to be a, a talent war. The, the, ultimately, the, uh, one of the biggest sources of harm to Russia and Putin of this illegal invasion is that he's lost some of his best talent. Hundreds of thousands of people have just left. The future, this, um, as Calder and I have been saying pretty consistently, lies in our capacity to retain a dominance and a lead in the key areas of emerging technology. There will be a few thousand people who are absolutely key to that. And a lot of them will be in China and Russia. And we have to create an environment where they feel welcome and happy in the West. So I, I think this big moral panic about you know, Chinese people working in tech and stuff is really, really dangerous. We, we've got to be able to chew gum and walk at the same time on this. Thank you. Okay, there's some, I'm just trying to see who's, this lady here with the, in the middle there, and then, and then we'll, we'll go to, sorry, we'll go to the gentleman behind afterwards. So let's have those two questions together if we can. Sure, thank you very much. So follow up on the NATO question. Um, I'm Swedish and obviously following very closely what's happening with Sweden's application to NATO and Finland has obviously already joined. How do you think that's going to influence obviously the relationship with Russia and do you think that will be seen as a provocation more than anything? Calder, what do you think? Well, it, it's extraordinary that Putin's whole narrative 
has been uh, Ukraine joining, joining NATO. And here we have two countries that are actually joining NATO. And as far as I can see, it does not seem to be a red flag to Putin, so which suggests that there's something else going on in his mind. Or, and I, I'm afraid, perhaps this is going to be a slow burn uh, with Putin and that his anger regarding the accession of Finland and Sweden into NATO will get revealed publicly in the, in the, the years to come. I, I just don't have a, um, a, a good answer. It will undoubtedly, though, feed all of his demons about his age-old um, paranoia of being encircled, um, and that he, he has he has he has spectacularly managed to actually um, bring cohesion uh, to NATO in a way that NATO itself but, has but been Misha, unable to do. But Misha, he doesn't care much about NATO himself, that's, that's does he? That's a fairy tale for domestic consumption. That's that's a fairy tale for for Russian audience that that remembers from Soviet propaganda that Na NATO is evil, mm. he's not obsessed with NATO. He doesn't care about that. He, he's not insulted by, uh, by, by Finland and Sweden. Okay. He, it's, it's, not, it's not his cup, cup of tea. He doesn't care about that. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's one more. Um, let's have Peter Frankopan at the back. Thank you. Could the panel say something about um, Russian uses of proxies in their capacity, in their use of spycraft at the moment? Alex, can you... Sorry, can you just, can the you the Russian use of proxies. Well, they... Um, in their spycraft. In the, yeah. Do you want to well, give an example, Peter, do you want to give an example or two yeah. of that? Well, if I was, if I was working for um, Sir Alex... Um, I would want to, and I was looking at what the Russians might be doing, I'd spend a lot of my attention following what the Russians are doing, but the Russians have assiduously cultivated contacts and capabilities in other parts of the world that don't get mentioned on events like this, like Africa, where mm -hmm. more than half the countries voted against um, condemnation of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. All yeah. of that capacity means that if we were looking at threats that might escalate, where, they, where might they come from that are not yeah. Russian but through uses of North Koreans, Iran has been yeah. on the move, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I think they've been uh, not very good at that is the answer. I think uh, you raise a really important point. I think it was a really big risk. And when this started, I expected it to really kick off. So the Western Balkans would have been a very good example, a place with massive Russian influence where they could have made our life complicated. Um, and, of course, this is fertile ground. It's a truism that we're now in a, a multipolar, largely non-aligned world where there's lots of scope. Uh, to return to the theme of the competence of the Russian intelligence services, the reality is they're now completely focused on, on Ukraine and seem to be having great difficulty pursuing a broader set of strategic objectives. Truthfully, you know, I don't think we're feeling their effects more broadly. So. Uh, what you say is, is a threat, and they should, well, and obviously I don't think they should be doing it, but I, I imagine they would want to do it, but we don't see that much of it. Great. I think I'm afraid. Uh, do you want to finish up? Yeah, just one. Last, just one okay, last one, word, one, very last quickly. The last thing is that unfortunately we already see uh, the Russian intelligence using, for instance, Bulgarian in this country, and they were arrested just in January, five people. So actually they know how to use at least uh, some people uh, in their purposes. Um, well, very quickly, one sentence for Peter at the back there. Um, Russia, yes, active in the, what we call the Global South, but I, but I would be increasingly looking at what China is doing there. And um, it's been told to me um, by African delegations at the Kennedy School that when um, America comes into town, they get a lecture. When China comes into town, they get a new airport. And that is going to be the real uh, significant battleground, as you highlight. That's the perfect way to end this. Thank you very much. Will you... Well, thank you.